Hi, everyone, and welcome to 50 Ways to Improve Habitat in Your Yard. Um, my name is Sam Adams Lanham. I am the Community Engagement Librarian at the Barrington Area Library, and that means that I work on creating programs for the benefit of and in collaboration with our local nonprofits. Um, I am taking, I asked Peggy's permission to do a quick commercial for a couple of programs that I have coming up next week. I'm sure many of you have um, heard about or read of our new Barrington Area Volunteer Connection. Um, if you're curious to know more and you are someone who is interested in maybe finding volunteer opportunities or is already volunteering and would like some more, there will be a program on Monday night, which is Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service at 7.30 p.m. You can register for that on the library's website. If you are involved with a nonprofit in any kind of leadership or management cap capacity, there is a program, one of the nonprofit know-how sessions at noon on Thursday, the 21st. And same thing, you may register for that on the library's calendar. So that's the end of my commercial. Um, as I said, it is my great privilege to be able to work with our local nonprofits to bring you programs um, to help learn more about the, the exciting things that are going on in our area today. So in honor of Citizens for Conservation's 50th anniversary, Peggy will share important ways to use shrubs, trees, native plants in all seasons, water resources, and earth-friendly practices to improve the habitat for birds, pollinators, and other useful critters. Um, Peggy has been a volunteer with Citizens for Conservation for 16 years. Um, she was formerly the president of CFC and is currently the chair of the Community Education Committee and serves on the board of directors. Her yard has improved habitat with over 200 species of native plants. And with that, Peggy, I will let you begin. Thank you very much, Sam. I'm pleased to have you all joining us today. Uh, this is the first of our, our winter series of, of programs the Community Education Committee does every year. They're usually live. This year, they're going to be webinars. And at the end of the program, I'll let you know about our February program that's coming up. Citizens for Conservation has three main uh, pillars of our mission. One is land acquisition. The other one is restoration of that land. And the third is education. And uh, one of the ways we do that is with our community education programs. Uh, we also have youth education programs, but I'm chair of the community education program. And as Sam said, it's our 50th anniversary. And so I decided that uh, we should have a program to launch this 50th year with 50 ways to improve habitat in your yard. But before we get into that, I'd like to, oops, that's not. Let's just talk about the habitat itself. This is a quote from Doug Tallamy that is, is really driving a lot of what we're doing these days. In the past, we've asked one thing of our gardens, to be pretty, and now they have to support life, sequester carbon, uh, support pollinators and manage water. And why, why has that changed? Why, why that? The, the fact is that 90%, approximately 90% of the habitat in the country has disappeared. It's been turned into farmland. Uh, people have, have cut down uh, things like milkweed because they thought it was a weed instead of a, a, a plant that supports uh, the, the wildlife. So we must create diversity in our own yards. There are 90% of insects depend on only one species of plants. And Birds depend on insects. And so if those plants aren't there, the insects aren't there, the birds aren't there, and the uh, birds and, and the other pollinators that are need, need them for support. So we know we need to have, uh, I've got to be doing this right now. Oops, this is what I, would, I just, just said. So we're, we're about creating that habitat. And I know some of you are already are doing that, have been doing it for a long time, um, but I hope you'll pick up on a couple more possible tips this morning. The categories that I'm going to use are native trees, shrubs, 
something about that I call front yard landscaping, all of, you know, these different categories. I'm going to talk fast because this is a lot of territory to cover. So, uh, and as Sam said, we're recording and the recordings will be available on both the library uh, platform and the Citizens for Conservation website uh, af after a little while, not immediately today, uh, so that you don't have to be writing down everything I say, but, but this is what we'll be working on. Darn it, I have to keep doing this. So the first category is native trees. This is a photo at Baker's Lake in Barrington. Uh, that's the lake back in the background there. Um, and this is what some of the, the village of Barrington owns this property, but Citizens for Conservation has restored it. And this is what, it's just spectacular. If you get a chance to go for a walk in May the ground is just covered with wildflowers. And that is what some of it looked like to start with. So if you're only going to do one thing as a result of, of watching this program today, I encourage you to plant an oak tree. Oak hickory woods covered the savannas in Northern Illinois 150 years ago, and they support, uh, an oak tree supports more insects than any, and birds, and than any other single species of, of trees, of, of plants. So, plant an oak, or if you have an oak, maybe you could plant more. The species of oaks that fit almost any condition. Um, and, and I just might, this is a footnote I put on here, always plant trees and or any other plants that are native to, to this Illinois area. And we'll be talking a little bit more about that as we go along. Here are some oaks. I'm not, I don't have exhaustive examples of each of these, but, but I wanted to put a couple of examples of each of the categories. And if you are looking for more detail about each of these things I'm talking about, the Citizens for Conservation website has a, uh, uh, under, uh, right on the main page, you can see a native plant database. And that tells you how tall they get, how, what kind of uh, conditions they want. I've got a little bit of that information on here. This is a white oak. They are the majestic oaks. They're not the big uh, Halloween trees like the, the bur oaks, but they are a big, beautiful tree. And you can see here a little bit of the, um, what the leaf looks like. That's usually the easiest way to tell the difference in the oaks is, is by, by looking at the leaves. Another uh, wonderful oak is the red oak. And that, it, it, it says it gets as big. Typically, they are not quite as large. They need much more sun. The, the white oaks say sun too, but I have a, a grove of white oaks in my yard that, that are remnants. I mean, they were here before, 100 years before the houses were built. And, and they aren't big and spread like the one I showed you. They are, they're tall and skinny because they grew up together, but it's from, from lack, a little less, less sun. They weren't planted that way. That's just the way that, you know, the acorns uh, germinated. Another wonderful tree to plant is a shagbark hickory. Look at the shagginess of this bark. Um, they, they, again, it says full sun, minor, you know, shading each other because there's so many of them. But one of the benefits of the shagbark is that things live under the shags. Uh, it is the host tree for the morning cloak butterfly, for example, a black butterfly. And it, it uh, hosts a number of other things. In the, in the winter, a lot of the critters that we like to see in the summer have to have places to, to, to shelter over the winter and the shag of the shag bark is one of the ways that do that. Here are a number of other really good native trees that, that help with the habitat as well. Um, one of these, I don't, I, I don't have photos of them all. I didn't have time and, and room to put them all out here, but um, the tulip tree is the host for the Eastern swallowtail butterfly. So again, there's each of these, um, some of them host lots of different bugs, uh, birds and butterflies, but, but some of them are very specific to one. <laughs> the red bud on here, I wish I should have had to put a photo up because it's a gorgeous tree. If you don't have a red bud, that's another one to put in. Uh, any of these would work. The red bud doesn't get quite as big as the rest of them, but it gets its beautiful sort of uh, rosy colored flowers early in the spring. And the value of that is that uh, early spring, there's, there's uh, the birds coming back, the, the butterfly, the uh, uh, other pollinators need pollen early and there's not a lot of things blooming yet. And the red bud is one of the earliest to bloom. 
So lots of good suggestions for trees. Here's not, what not to plant or cut down if you have them. This is a picture of a Norway maple and they are pretty when they're in, in color like this. But the problem with it is that it is, it's not a native. It doesn't support our insects and our pollinators. It is so dense that, that nothing will grow under it. People say, what can I plant under my Norway maple? And we have to say nothing. Even the ground covers don't want to be under there because it, it, there's, there's literally no light that gets through. And if you have one and you don't want to cut it down, all you can really do is put some mulch under there. Uh, the Chinese elm is another one. Uh, there aren't as many of them around, although it was the American elm that got the elm disease that cut, got rid of so many of those. But the Chinese elm is very invasive. It pops up everywhere. You'll get little elm sprouts going. And the same is true with the, the tree of heaven. Uh, when I moved in, someone before me in this house had planted a tree of heaven and it was just sending shoots up all over the place. And yeah, the lawnmower would cut them down, but it was, it, it really didn't belong here. And again, these aren't native and so they don't support our native insects and, 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 and birds. The Bradford and calorie pears are the ones that you see very much along roadsides along the, the right of way. Uh, a while back, a lot of villages planted them because they have beautiful white flowers in the spring and they don't get real big. But the problem is that they, uh, they're so invasive and they cross pollinate with our native pears. So they're driving away all of the native pears and, and, and plums that we have in our area, in our woodlands and whatnot. And I think well, they're on an invasive species list now. The, the nurseries are not supposed to sell them anymore, but there sure are a lot of them out there. Um, and it, 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 the, the cutting down the tree of heaven in my, my front yard was the first time I ever cut down a live tree, but I, I've gotten wiser about some of them may be alive, but they are, they are doing damage to our, or to our, our uh, habitats for sure. And they don't provide any benefits. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm gonna move on quickly to Oh, here quickly again, uh, about taking care of trees, don't mound the soil around the base and don't let your landscapers do that. Uh, what it does is, is uh, holds the soil moisture up against the trunk of the tree and it either rots or gets mold and the roots will tend to grow up into the mulch rather than down into the ground and ultimately will kill the tree. So don't do that. If you, do, if you need to just have mulch around it, we're gonna be talking about uh, other mulches in a minute, in a little bit, but, but uh, just, just use uh, ground up leaves. That, that serves the purpose better and it doesn't need to be mounded. And of course, do not use pesticides. If you kill bad bugs, you also kill good bugs. The pesticides are indiscriminate that way. So we'll be talking more about that too. Now we'll get into the native shrubs. This uh, beginning slide is a, a high bush cranberry. It's not a cranberry, but it's a, it's a viburnum, but it's called a cranberry. Lovely, lovely uh, uh, berries in the fall and the birds love them. So I'm gonna start this uh, section on what not to have. Uh, most of the time, if you have any kind of shrubs that have just grown up in your yard and you haven't planted them, they're either buckthorn or honeysuckle or both. They are both very, very invasive, difficult to get rid of, and really, really damaging to the environment. A number of years ago, Lake County did a survey of the number of the kind of trees in all of Lake County. And before settlement here, it was mostly oaks and hickories. Now 60% of the trees in Lake County are buckthorn. They've just totally taken over. If you drive by a, a forest preserve, you'll see masses of this green uh, shrub. The, the yellow one is, is uh, it, you know, in the fall turning yellow. The buckthorn stays green all the way up until it freezes. Um, and and the, the problem with it is a twofold. It, poisons the ground so nothing else can grow under there and it prevents its, its shade is so dense that it keeps the saplings from growing. So even if there's an oak tree nearby and it drops an acorn, it won't be able to, to survive under the buckthorn. Uh, now I usually say don't use herbicide, but with buckthorn you have to herbicide it. Well, if you can dig it, that's fine if it's small enough, but if you're cutting it and there's a stump, you must herbicide the stump or it'll just come back in, in, in lots and lots of shoots. You may notice sometimes the, you know, when the electric company goes along the roadsides and cuts the tops of anything that's in, uh, messing with the, the electric lines, 
when they cut the buckthorn, it just gets thicker and thicker and thicker at the bottom because they don't take the tree out. And honeysuckle is another one. It's an it's a, uh, invasive. It comes from Japan. Doesn't provide any benefit. I, there's a little bit of nectar in the flowers when it flowers in the spring, but it too is so terribly invasive and it's really hard to get rid of. It's another one that you do need to, to herbicide. And it gets real gnarly and takes up the space that you might have some beautiful ones in instead. Okay, the value of some native shrubs, in addition to uh, the, the obvious of having berries, they provide structural diversity. And there are some species like the wood thrush that only thrive in dense thickets. And other little birds like the juncos and chickadees use them for protection from, from the predators. Uh, so they provide multiple services. I, have, I make a point of having some, some pretty dense shrubs not too far from my bird feeders so that I'm, I'm attracting the birds, but I don't want them to, to uh, be endangered by doing so. So they grab their seeds and then run over and sit on the branch of a, of a shrub. Here are some examples of, of shrubs that we uh, recommend. There's lots and lots more, but uh, let's start with some of these. Uh, highlighter. No, that's not what I wanted to do. Just a minute. There we go. The, the black haw here, uh, if, if you have a lot of buckthorn and, and a lot of people have it along the roads and they say, well, I wanna keep it because it's a screen. Our recommendation is take it down, cut it down, herbicide the stump, and then plant back haw, black haw viburnums. They make as good a screen in terms of a hedgerow, uh, but at the same time support lots of plant, uh, lots of uh, insects, and so forth. And they, they get this beautiful color in the fall. The high bush cranberry is the one that I showed the up close picture of the of the of the berries. Uh, this is one that likes to be in more uh, wetter areas. Um, but I have to give you a, a caution right to start with here. Uh, in the last few years, there's been a cranberry, I mean, there's a, a viburnum borer that's been out and about. And it isn't necessarily attacking all of them, but it sure got after my, uh, one of the, the, I had a bunch of viburnum, I had the dentatum, which got eaten. Consequently, I didn't put it here. And the Morton Arboretum recommends to get rid of the borer that you clip off the ends of the stems where the borers start. And you can, if you look at them, you can see the little brown dots on the stem. Uh, and I was busy out there cutting off the tips of my uh, high bush cranberry, trying to keep the borer from spreading, but it got, it got both of my shrubs that were down there. So you may live in an area that hasn't, it doesn't have it. If you have a cranberry, uh, uh, sorry, a viburnum of any kind, look carefully at them. If you start seeing any little holes in the leaves, usually in the new leaves, the new tender ones, clip them off right away. Um, but I've also found that there are some of the viburnums that haven't been uh, um, attacked by the borer. I'll talk about those in just a minute. There's also this service berry. Now this doesn't look very dense, but it, but it gets to be a very nice big shrub. And it has beautiful, beautiful uh, flowers in the spring and then berries. And the berries are edible by humans as well. Of course, the animals love them as well. And then the uh, nine bark here is also a, uh, a nice big shrub that does it, uh, is, uh, useful. I'm trying to get rid of this photos here. I'm not sure I can do that. Anyway, um, here are some shrubs that get tall, not necessarily as dense, but tall shrubs. The black chokeberry, again, all of these have both flowers and berries, and the, the birds love the flowers. The, Everybody loves the flowers. The birds love the berries as they do. The pagoda dogwood is one of my favorite. Uh, I have a lot of shade because of my big trees and this one loves to be in the shade. And it has a very nice uh, layered look to the flowers and so uh, to, the, to the branches um, and, and just a lovely uh, specimen tree. It's not so much a, sh uh, a hedgerow as the other ones were, but it, but it, uh, it spreads out and it, uh, then gets a really lovely berries in the in the fall. Here's a nanny berry viburnum. Mine haven't gotten this big, but but it it, it is uh, one that the, the viburnum that the the borers haven't gotten on. I, I'm hope, keeping my fingers crossed and watching them. And my very favorite is the maple leaf viburnum. It stays a little bit smaller. It's this beautiful flowers in the spring, gorgeous orange uh, leaves in the fall. Uh, and it's the one of the viburnums that is happiest in the shade. 
It's a little hard to find uh, our, our, our native plant sale in May. Uh, we, we, and, and again in September, we go looking for them. Uh, they grow slower and so they're not as big when, when uh, we're planting them. Um, but they really are worth looking for. If you have shade, that would be an excellent one to put in there. Now here are some shrubs that, that stay a little bit smaller, but uh, provide both the food and the pollen. The hazelnut, a beautiful little shrub. This is, a, a, the, the photo here is of the, of the clump of the nuts. And uh, of course the squirrels love them. And so they'll go after them sometimes before you can get them. They're, they're, they're the, they're, you know, what, uh, the, the, the cultivated version of them or what we, you know, we buy, buy when we buy, uh, filberts or hazelnuts. Uh, but this is the native version and they are edible if you can get them before all the animals do. But if you're planting them for the birds and the animals, then that's, that's a good thing to have. This is one of the smaller sumacs. The uh, staghorn sumac gets, gets huge, but, but this one, it, and it's just such a gorgeous color that it's a nice, it's a nice little clumpy shrub. Uh, the, the shrubby uh, St. John's wort, there's a, there's a smaller uh, one as well, but um, it is, it, it wants full sun, grows not too huge, maybe, maybe three feet or so, uh, but the bees love the St. John's wort. You'll just have it covered with bees. And the gray dogwood is another one that is a, a rather prolific native, um, but it's not invasive. It, it, it just comes up in the woods. It's definitely a, an understory one and it has the, uh, lovely berries in the fall and, and, and a nice color. So it's got a little bit flower. The flowers aren't real showy, but they are useful for the pollinators. And then we get it, get the, uh, uh, the berries for the fall in the fall as well. I am trying to figure out how to get rid of the photos on top of my screen here so I can see what, what's left here. Okay, the New Jersey tea is a tiny little, well, it's not tiny, but I mean, compared to some of the rest of the shrubs, it only gets to be about two feet tall, maybe, maybe three, but uh, wants to be in the full sun. And it's just, it's gorgeous flowers that, uh, again, really, really attract the, the bees and the, the butterflies. Lovely, lovely shrub. It's another one I'm going to talk about in the, in the, uh, for the front yard, it fits well there. Okay. Now, in terms of pruning native shrubs, we really, they really should just be left to be natural. You know, they're not pruned in nature or the, the pruning happens when a dead one breaks off. So um, uh, this is not native plants, but it's, it's my neighbor. I, it, we don't need to make bowling balls or little boxes out of our shrubs. If you do need to prune, prune selectively. And by that, I mean, uh, for example, my uh, my elderberry is is uh, sort of its branches come way out and it's over a, a, a walk. So I will prune the branch that's hanging out, the bumping people in the face. So you know that kind of thing. But but you don't you don't want to and you don't want to be spending the time pruning. But but they really don't want to be pruned unless you just need to, uh, as I said, take something that uh, or a dead a dead stalk in the middle of it, something. Okay. Here's the front yard landscaping section. And by that, I mean, there are some villages, some local areas that fuss about how tall things get in people's front yard. We've had a number of people contact us and say, I've planted native plants in my front yard and my neighbors are complaining. And the problem is the prairie plants, some of them get to be six, eight feet tall, like the uh, compass plant or the, uh, um, big blue stem, they really aren't designed, <laughs> if that's the right word, they, they don't belong in a front yard, in a small yard, in an area that wants front yards to be neat and tidy. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have native plants there, but there are some that you select. So that's one of the issues, but also there's some design elements that should be used when you're using native plants, just as when you're using other kinds of plants. The height of the plants is a key one, but also the edging and borders. This one, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a walk. If you, in fact, edge 
a bed of natives, just as you would edge a bed of non-natives. They don't look wild and, and scruffy as sometimes people get uh, fussing about them. Now, this is an example. One of the plants I don't recommend for the front yard is, the, is this um, uh, jopai weed. It's a wonderful native plant and I do it, want you to put it in your backyards, but, but it works here because they've used the good design elements. They've got the low plants in front. They've definitely got this, this driveway edged. And so then the, and the, the uh, Joe Pye and these taller ones can, can fit there. But ordinarily you don't just want tall ones out on the edges of things. I have a little bit of prairie in my front yard uh, that, where I have the, the full sun right down by the road. And I've had to select low plants for that. And I'll share some of what kind of, what, what fits there. But so you pay attention to some of the design elements and choose well-behaved natives. So they don't go uh, wild. <laughs> the, the, um, the best milkweed for, for designed neat gardens is the butterfly weed. And it's gorgeous. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful plant, but it stays about maybe not even two feet tall, maybe 18 inches and a nice clump. It spreads, it, you know, it gets bigger, but, but it's not uh, aggressive. And of course, it's just absolutely attracts all the butterflies. So the monarchs, but everything else too. So that's a, that's a wonderful one to put in the front yard. Uh, I really like the white wild indigo, the Baptisia. There are some non-native Baptisias in the, in the nurseries. Make sure you get the uh, Baptisia leucantha. And by the way, even if you don't know the native, the Latin names of these, make sure if you're looking for one that you write that down. When you go to buy a plant, now if you're buying it from our native plant sale, all our plants are natives. But if you're going to a plant a nursery or a, a garden center and, and you want to buy one, make sure you look for the native words on it. Um, because for example, with this purple coneflower, and they're all, you see them a lot and, and they're quite common, but a few years ago, the Botanic Gardens wanted to make a cultivar out of it and they wanted to make it yellow. And so they cultivated the uh, uh, purple coneflower that was yellow and they called it, it's an Echinacea purpurea golden glow. I think that was the word. Anyway, anytime you see a name like that added, you know it's a cultivar and not the original native. And what happens when natives are cultivated for a reason, <clears throat> I mean, in that case, they were cultivating it to get it to be yellow, uh, but they lose some of their native characteristics. And in this case, the purple coneflower, which is really, really hardy here. I mean, it's a tough cookie, but it became not winter hardy when it, be, when it was cultivated, when it was, uh, uh, hybridized. So look for the double Latin names, write them down if you need to when you're going to be out, going out shopping for them. Uh, another good uh, landscape plant is that doesn't get real tall is the blazing star. These need to be in a clump because they tend to bend over a little bit if they're not supporting each other. But oh my goodness, the bees love them. Because, and, and this is something we'll I'll talk about more, but anytime a plant has multiple flowers like this along the stem, you'll attract more bees. The same thing is true with the indigo. There's just that many more flowers that are just right nearby. They don't have to fly very far to find their next nectar. So, so uh, th those are always a good a good suggestion. And I have the I have the indigo in a front bed, and it gets to be a, like a little shrub. It dies back completely in the winter, but but it it's about you know a, a couple feet around and a couple maybe three feet tall, and so it can be a a, a specimen plant with littler things around it. The, the bee balm, the bergamot, uh, again, this is another one. There's all sorts of um, cultivars out there. Make sure you look for the Monarda fistulosa. That's the native species right here. And it too is just a, a magnet for the uh, pollinators. Here's a few other ones that go that fit well. The lobelia, the great blue lobelia, uh, is uh, likes to be have its feet wet. It's not good. it's not a prairie plant. It's more a water's edge, but it, it does okay in in medium mesic soil. Uh, but but I have it in my rain garden, and it's happy there. The obedient plant. Um, sometimes I call it a disobedient plant. It was it does want to spread a lot. So if you have a a, a bigger area to fill in, that's fine it won't stay put in one little place where you plant it. So again, that may not be the uh, disciplined plant that you want, depending on how you're arranging your, your uh, front yard garden. 
Uh, Round-eyed Susans, of course, are very often seen all over the place, they, but they're, uh, they, they start blooming late July and, and bloom well into, the, into September. So they're, they're, a lot of things you know, have already died, uh, the flowers are gone, and so the birds and, and uh, pollinators still need them. And of course, they go, the birds go after the seeds in the centers of these. The royal catchfly, I think, I recommend instead of, there's a, the red lobelia is, is called cardinal flower. And it, I mean, it's in the same uh, species as the blue lobelia, but it is touchy. It'll, it'll grow for a couple of years and then not be there. It too wants to be wet. Whereas the royal catchfly is equally as beautiful and it's, it's tougher. It, it, uh, it'll, it, it doesn't need to be wet and it grows, it comes back year after year. You won't wonder where it went and it spreads. So it, I mean, it not, not aggressively, but you'll get, you know, a number of, of plants coming up. So if you want a red, white, and blue, you've got the blue lobelia, the catchfly, and the culver's root, which is a, a tall spiky flower. They make a nice combination. Again, when you're talking, you know, looking at the landscape design elements, the shapes, the colors, the sizes, how big they get, <coughs> all of those elements can be paid attention to. Now, here are some landscape plants for shade. Uh, I love the red baneberry. Its flowers are little, little white clumps aren't, aren't particularly showy, but boy, the, 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 uh, the, the, the green and the berries are. And, and, they, and they get berries along about July, which is a little earlier than some of the other things do. Uh, the columbine is another one to be careful when you're buying it to make sure that you get the uh, Aquilegia canadensis because there's lots of other columbines out there. Um, this one, uh, the, the hummingbirds and, and I mean, the, the, the cone-shaped flowers like this are the ones that really attract uh, the, the, uh, the, the birds and the, and the pollinators that like to get down inside the plant. Um, there is a, a very nice blue columbine that is native to, to, Cal to Colorado. It's the Colorado state flower, uh, but that's not our native one. Here is the Virginia bluebells. This is just what one of the little heads of flowers look like. These are a wonderful pl a plant to plant under a tree, for example, a whole, spread the whole area. They, they make a nice mat. They're very aggressive in their area. Um, they transplant well, if they, you know, one gets not where you want it to be, but they, they die back completely. I mean, after they're done blooming, there's a, the, the leaves are there for another couple of weeks and then they're completely gone. So if you plant a bunch of them, you want to plant and intersperse them with ferns or ginger or some other uh, plants, ground cover type plants that will stay all, all summer so that you don't have a bare space after these have died back, but boy, they're showy. And, the, 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 and they're early. So again, all the pollinators love them. The uh, woodland phlox is one of my favorite because it's very showy. Some of the early uh, uh, spring woodland plants are right, they're right down on the ground. They're very little and you have to look, they're lovely like the little anemones, but you have to be up close to see them. This one, um, I have my, my house is on a hill and I have about half an acre between the, the yard and my house and then another half acre in the backyard. And these can be blooming up around all over the front yard and, and they're, they're visible from the street. Um, and, they, and the flowers last a long time. Some of the early ones are, are, are pretty uh, ephemeral, but, uh, and, and they, they're, they do spread. I mean, they'll sprinkle themselves here and there and, and wherever they wanna be, but they're transplantable. So if one comes up where you don't want it, you just move it to where you do want it. And it's, it's just, if you don't have those, I, I highly recommend you get some of these, even if you already have good, good habitat. This is a shade plant. It can take some sun because it, you know, it, it comes out in the spring before the trees have leafed out. So it's getting sun then. It, it wouldn't be do, do well in, in hot sun in the summer, but the leaves stay all winter. I mean, in not all winter, all, all summer. They don't die back when the flowers die back as the, as the uh, bluebells do. So you have a nice landscape clump there even when the flowers are gone. And here's the native geranium. And again, there's tons of geranium out there. This one, the geranium maculatum is the, is the native. And again, it supports all our native insects. And, and uh, it, it too will, well, it's like this flock sprinkles itself around. It can do sun or shade. Um, if you have an area that doesn't have much, uh, uh, planted in it, put some of these in, and they'll, they'll, they, they don't get big mats. They just sprinkle themselves. So you have a I'm sorry? Okay. Okay. There it is. You're right. Now, there are some well behaved grasses. There are some prairie grasses I mentioned earlier, like the uh, big blue stem and uh, maybe Indian grass that really aren't meant for front yards, for, for ni nice native, not neat little plants. 
planted areas, but here are some that are. My very favorite is a prairie drop seed. It's, it's this, it stays in this little clump, maybe two feet tall at the, at the most, spreads wide it, because the, the, it's called drop seed because the seed heads just come over, bend over. You can kind of see a little one coming down here and drop their seeds out on the sides. It's very conservative though. Um, we have them in the prairie, but we also grow them at, at CFC in our, in our native plant nursery because the, the seeds don't compete real well in an, you know, with, with other aggressive plants. So we make sure that we, uh, we have enough seed to plant. Yours in the your yard will stay put, it'll spread, it'll get bigger, but not, but not aggressively. And uh, just as a nice counterpoint to some of the, the uh, plant, uh, the plants you might put it, for example, with that uh, butterfly weed, the orange milkweed, they, they, they are compatible in terms of size and shape. The little blue stem is a good landscape plant. Uh, it doesn't, it, it gets to be maybe three feet tall. It's not short, but it doesn't get six or eight feet tall. And this is in the fall when all these little white fluffy things are the seeds. And it, it is just, it stays in a clump. I saw um, a, 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 a company, a, a business headquarters had had its uh, front area landscape with native plants and they had a lovely patch of the big of the little blue stem and this side oats grandma. This is uh, this is in the prairie so it's it, there's a lot of it here but it is it, it gets its seeds hanging off on the side of the stems. I don't know it's really tiny on here to see. Lovely little plant doesn't get real tall and and stays in clumps. So those would be three I would recommend if you want grasses amongst your planting in the front yard. Okay. Now here are some other natives that are wonderful for habitat, but but are a bit too uh, aggressive and or too tall for a, a tidy little spot. This purple hyssop uh, gets to be oh maybe six feet tall, a pretty pretty big thing, um, but it is just a magnet for insects, for bees particularly. Um, let me find what I have. And the, the milkweeds, all of the, the, the best milkweed, as I said, for the front yard, for a, for a tidy area is the, is the uh, butterfly weed. But um, this one the, is a common milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, is um, the one that was growing a lot along the farm fields that people thought were weeds or the farmers thought were weeds, so they cut them down. And so we lost all of that habitat for the migrating monarchs. They have to have a place to, to stop on their migration. And um, it's a beautiful, the flowers are beautiful as you see here, uh, but it, but it can, it, it's pretty aggressive. It'll pop up here and there and, and wherever. And if you have a spot where that's okay, that's wonderful. Or if you're planting it and you want it to stay, you know, look more intentional, plant a bunch of them. Don't let one be there. And then it looks like it's a weed that came in. In fact, that's the case with a lot of these plants. Don't plant one. It's easier for, for the uh, pollinators to find them if in fact you have a clump of them rather than just one of these and one of that, okay? We, we recommend that to people that are uh, at shopping at our, at our native plant sale. Oh, I'd like a bunch of different things. Well, buy at least three of each of them so that they can be in a nice little clump for the, both for the visual of it, but also for the pollinators. This prairie coreopsis is, is another one that it, 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 it spreads well. So if you want it to spread, that's a great one to have. The rattlesnake master is definitely a prairie plant and it wants to be full sun, uh, but it's a little bit uh, too tall usually for, the, for a, a, a tidy little garden, although you might, you might try it. It doesn't get massively tall. The seed heads though, they're, they're a tough little ball, it, it, almost like a, a, a medieval mace, you know, with a spot ball with the spikes on it. Um, hard to, we, we collect the seeds, uh, you know, on, on our prairie to, so we can spread them other places and you have to pick them with gloves on. But anyway, um, the birds love it. The, the, uh, the chickadees, the goldfinches, uh, we have to get them before the birds do. Although if you're planting them for habitat, you just love, love having them there for the birds to get. And, and they last, you know, the birds will still be getting them in the fall. 
And here's the, the purple Joe pie. There's, there's two versions of two uh, species of, of Joe pie. One is better, the purple Joe pie is, is, is the uh, sun or shade and the spotted Joe pie uh, is a full sun, but they do get to be six or seven feet tall and especially in the sun. They're wonderful for the for the uh, the pollinators, but but again, they're not. You, you wouldn't want it probably right by your front door unless you have something tall around it. I guess. Don't mean to be negative about these, but they're you know the right places for things to be planted. Okay, I've been talking about the pollinators, so let's look at them. You see the bees on here; they're just everywhere on this showy goldenrod. Uh, goldenrods, by the way, you get a bad rap because they uh, bloom at the same time as ragweed and ragweed is the one that causes the hay fever and, and the goldenrod does not. Um, and yet people say, oh, I don't want goldenrod because I have hay fever. Well, I am a hay fever sufferer and I have lots of goldenrod in my yard and it doesn't bother me. I just make sure I dig out any ragweed that's around. So do plant milkweed, as you know, for the monarchs other butterflies like it as well, but here's a monarch caterpillar on the milkweed pods, okay? And this uh, is a swallowtail that its specific plants that it likes is anything in the carrot family. The meadow rue is one of the plants that is. If you have a vegetable garden, it might like your carrots. Uh, and, you know, there's other, I think kale is in that same family. I'm not a real expert on the vegetables, uh, but, but the other plant that these like is Queen Anne's lace. Now that's not a native, but you do find it around along the woodsides and sometimes in the prairies. I let mine come up in, um, along my roadside until it's done blooming and then I pull it out because it's very aggressive. But, but uh, you, you can, if, if, you, if you're planting to get a specific plant for a specific pollinator, uh, by the way, the best source for that is, there's two, but one of them is Doug Tallamy's first book called Bringing Nature Home. I think it's about a third of the book at the back that specifically says, if you want this butterfly, plant this plant. And it gives you, and, and, it, and it, it has sections by, I mean, it's a national book, but it has sections by, you, you have the Midwest. It doesn't just have Northern Illinois, but it does have which ones are native to which section of the country. And of course, uh, nectar plants, all sorts of nectar plants for the summer. That's not so hard to do. Most of them fit that, that bill. And in the fall, you need to make sure you have some things still blooming for the migrating monarchs. They still need the nectar uh, to, to uh, beef up for their long migration south. And in fact, Get on to my next slide here. Um, you want to have multi flowered plants. As I mentioned earlier, the liatris is one, the bergamot, uh, golden rods, just masses of flowers like that. Um, and, and here is a rusty patch bumblebee. Did, can you see the little space back here that says rusty patch? Those are endangered in Illinois. And we have found them in our properties in uh, Flint Creek, Savannah. And uh, this was, this was a, oh, by the way, all of these photos I have give cre credit for at the end of the, uh, of the program. Um, when I get to the birds, uh, Stephen Barton is um, going to be our presenter in February. And he is, he just has the most extraordinary photos of birds and bees and other butterflies and whatever. He's just an extraordinary photographer as well as uh, having planted native plants. I just wanna make the point, somebody at a program, we were doing a program, um, the Chicago Living Quarters program on bees a while back and somebody said, well, I would like to plant these things that I'm not sure I want to have bees in my yard because I'm allergic to them. And I think the issue is not bees, be, bumblebees don't sting unless you try to squeeze it in your hand or something, but they don't bump, jump out at you and sting like the wasps and the yellow jackets do. If you're a stung, you know, and you walk by somewhere, um, like I've had, had the wasps get into my uh, brick wall around the front of my house, they are bees. They're ja yellow jackets or wasps, hornets. Um, and so don't blame the bumblebees and try to allow things that support the bumblebees and not, Seriously. and the wasps aren't, aren't the ones that are out there uh, usually on that. They're the ones that bother you at the picnic table. Okay. 
Okay, there are other pollinators too that we need to pay attention to. And I don't know if you know this, but ants are the second best pollinator and propagators, uh, but pollinators next to bees. I love the story of bloodroot. I had some bloodroot in my yard way at the far back, and then I'd find it sort of coming up in, in little spots way far away from, from where the, the big patch of it was. And I thought, how it's, it's, it's way too far for the wind to carry the seeds. How is it getting there? And then way too far for the roots to spread. And then I learned about uh, aliosomes. The, the bloodroot has a large seed, quite large for the size of its flower, like a half inch across or so. And inside, it's got a green coating on it, and inside is a pulpy white, uh, a pulp, actually, that the ants love. So the ants go to the seed, eat that pulp, and then drop the seed wherever, it, which is left inside. They don't eat the seed, they eat the pulp. And so they're carrying those seeds all over, and they germinate, and we have, you know, blood root propagated here and there. It's another one that, just, that transplants well, by the way. So if, you, if your ants put it somewhere you don't want it, you can take, dig it up and move it. Um, but also, you know, the, the bad ants, the carpenter ants, pileated woodpeckers eat them. So if you have those outside, uh, and I know you don't want them in your kitchen, but if you have them outside, uh, the, let, maybe the woodpeckers will come. We are, by the way, getting more pileated woodpeckers around here. They were gone for a long time. So don't go putting pesticides on your anthills in your yard. They're good. Do what you want in your kitchen, but not, but not you know, trying to stop them from being out, outside. Then there's a story about dragonflies and, and damselflies. They need to hatch, the, the nymphs have to hatch in water. So not bird baths, but, but in, in, you know, if you have a stream or a pond, but they also have to have plants along the edge because the nymphs can't fly. So to get out of the water, they have to climb up on a plant. And so if you have a, 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 any water's edge, we'll talk a little bit more into the water category, but if you have rocks along there instead of plants, the nymphs won't be able to get out and, and they'll die and you won't have dragonflies in your yard. They also need clean water. They will not do with pollinated. Um, so I said, don't use pesticides. Pesticides kill every kind of a bug. Caterpillars that the baby birds need. But now here's an example. These are uh, uh, milkweed beetles. They are native. They don't do any good, but they also don't kill the plant because they have evolved together. And if they killed the plant, they wouldn't be alive either. So if you don't like them on there, take a bucket of soapy water and with a glove on, just scrape them off and into the water. And you know you don't have to have, have them there. There's so many of us that still have, are squeamish about bugs. Uh, but, but don't use pesticide because then you'll kill all the ones that, the, uh, that you want, the good bugs. All right, quickly now, hurry up, got to get to the birds. This is one of Steve Barton's wonderful photos. The bobolink on the, on the milkweed. And the fact is that different bird species need different habitats. So yeah, the more species you're trying to attract, the more kinds of habitats you need. Uh, I can't, I, I don't have bluebirds, for example, because they really prefer open prairie. But some of you who have bigger open spaces in your yard, if it's not just turf grass, and you can put some, some uh, plants in there, like the little blue stem I was showing you, uh, the bluebirds are more like, you're more likely to, to have the bluebirds come. This is a Steve Barton photo. Isn't that wonderful with them sitting there? Uh, woodpeckers prefer snags or brush piles. So I have lots of woodpeckers in my yard. I do have some snags, but they also just like to be on my uh, oaks and hickories. They, they go pecking for, for bugs in there and they make nests in there. And, and not all wrens, but the, but the sage wren prefers sedges. So the, the sedge wren <laughs> prefers sedges, that's a mouthful. So uh, if that's a specific, if you have, I haven't put a lot of time in on the sedges, but that is one of the benefits of having them. And of course the sedges go to seed too. So the birds get the seeds. I don't have photos of them, but the thrushes and cats birds prefer thickets. So have an area as we were talking about earlier about the, the, the black claw viburnum or, or the uh, service berries that get, get dense and, and they, can, they can nest in there. Now there are varying different kinds of seasonal needs as well. 
Uh, if you want to attract the, vi the migrating birds in the spring and fall, they need food. They need both shelter. They need shelter in both the spring and fall. So uh, think think in those terms. The nesting birds need twigs and and fiber, but in the spring, if you've cleaned up all of your uh, native plants in the fall and cut them all down, and then uh, they haven't started coming up yet when the migrating birds come and want to be, be, be making a nest, they won't have any nesting material. So leave your, your stock standing until the new plants come up in the spring so that the birds can, can find something to make a nest out of. The uh, stalks, for example, of the, um, my purple coneflower are, are still out there. And <clears throat> by the way, things live in those, in those stems during the winter too. Sometimes only the, the monarchs are the only birds that really, maybe one of the few that, that migrate, certainly that migrate as far as they do. And so the rest of them lay their eggs and, and stay you know, uh, dormant kind of over the winter, but they need a place to do that. And so they need the, the, the twigs, they need thatch, and then, of course, there's the, the birds that put their nests in the ground that need the thatch and grasses. There's another interesting thing. The fledglings, even though their nest might be in the tree, they may fall out of the nest before they can fly. And if, they, if it's just bare ground under there, if it's lawn if turf grass, they don't have any, uh, any uh, uh, protection. So the, they really need some ground cover under the trees to, to help them you know, survive until they grow big enough to, to fly. And of course, in summer, some hummingbirds need lots of sources of nectar. Your, your hummingbird feeder is fine, but, but also get lots of those flowers that have the tubes that they can get their beaks down in and, and, and get the nectar out. It's amazing. I don't have the number in front of me, but the amount of, of nectar that uh, hummingbirds do every day um, thought I had a, 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 the, I don't remember these numbers easily, but, um, but anyway, uh, and then of course in the winter, the, need, the, the birds need the seed, and the nuts and the seed sources. And that's one of the reasons to leave some of the native plants standing. Uh, the Monarda is another one that has wonderful seeds uh, for, the, for the birds to get well into November and, and, and December. When the snow knocks things over, it's not as easy. But they also need places to stash food, like the squirrels do. But the but the other uh, ones do as well, and shelter. Now, there's different sources of food. I've been talking about the, the bushes that have berries. Uh, these are a repeat of some of the ones I talked about before. This is a Steve Barton photo of the cedar waxwing with the berry in its mouth. Isn't that a wonderful photo? Get it? That's a I think that's on a, 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 a black chokeberry bush. And I'll, I have a picture of the winterberry. And it, it, oh, oh, no, I don't. I have the snow. The, the winterberry has the red bushes, red berries on it. And I do have a photo of that coming up. Um, you also, of course, need nectar plants. Um, and here's a hummingbird on the um, Silene, the royal catchfly that I showed you the picture of before. So it's, it's happy there. I haven't mentioned these, but the virgin spower is the only native clematis. It's a climbing vine and it does grow in some shade and, and sun, a wonderful uh, source of nectar. And, and it's Baltimore Orioles as well as the hummingbirds that go after these. The nodding wild onion is another one that I hadn't mentioned. We did talk about the columbine, but any most of the tube shaped flowers are, are great for the sources of nectar. Um, and then of course seed. Now um, the, the black oil sunflower seeds and millet, which come in most of the, the mixes that you, the seeds you buy, lots of birds like those. Uh, and, and some of these birds go, you know, and, and like, like the woodpeckers will go there as well as on the suet and so forth. Uh, Obviously, the, 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 the thistle feeders, the, the ones with the tiny little openings, the, the little birds, the chickadees, the finches, um, but also indigo buntings. I, I think the jays, I don't see the jays, I see the jays on my suet a lot. I don't see them on my Niger seeds. Uh, I just, uh, I fought the battle with the squirrels over my suet feeder until my, my son for Christmas gave me a, 
uh, squirrel buster suet feeder. I had the squirrel buster seeds, but uh, so that it, it's, it's just a wire mesh, but if the squirrel gets on it, it closes and, and, the, and the squirrel can't get at it. <laughs> and it makes the, the suet last. I, I was doing everything on my other suet feeder. I put Vaseline on the post so the squirrels couldn't climb up and they did anyway and so forth. So uh, the, I, I have every, every kind of woodpecker. Uh, I even saw a full red-headed woodpecker, which are very rare, but they've been, uh, the, I, I live not very far from the Deer Grove East Forest Preserve that's been restored and the woodpeckers have, they've seen the red-headed red woodpeckers there. So they've come a little ways over into my yard as well. Of course, you need the fruit and the berries. You know that the Baltimore Orioles want their orange halves. Um, to, to get at and, and any other the kind of uh, berries on the trees and the nectar and sugar water, as we talked about. I'm gonna move real quickly. This is what you don't want in your habitat. Um, I had a, a cat for a while that was, was an outdoor cat and there was no way I could keep him in, but luckily he went after the chipmunks in my yard, not the birds, but my, my present cat doesn't go outside. I won't do that again. And I real quickly want to get through the four season appeal. Uh, I've talked a little bit about that, but there are some things that are specifically spring plants that are just lovely. Uh, I didn't mention the Jacob's Ladder, lovely, lovely uh, spring uh, woodland plant, can take some sun, shooting stars, wonderful. Uh, a good one. These, these of course, bloom early and then, and then don't continue. The shooting stars die back a little bit later. The Jacob's Ladder keeps its leaves as the, flo the phlox does all winter, all summer. <clears throat> the, uh, the prairie smoke is another wonderful landscape plant, wants to be in the sun. Uh, this is when it's flowering and then its name from smoke comes because when it goes to seed, it's got this fluffy little seed head and it stays little and, and uh, very well behaved, as we say. Summer, you know about sunflowers. Um, there's several of them, but make sure again that you're, you're getting a native one. This is the Western sunflower. The Liatris, uh, this is, notice the, you can see the bee on here. Uh, we talked about the Eastern swallowtail on the, on the meadow rue and, and, and on the, uh, the, the red milkweed. Now, this is one that you may need to pay attention to. Some, a lot of people don't you know, do all the summer plants, but the fringe gentian blooms in August, September. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a Katie did sitting on here. He's green and he blends right in. A uh, beautiful plant. They're a little bit hard to, to, to grow, um, a little bit fussy, but the, uh, the bottle gentian is another gentian that is, is uh, much easier. Here are the goldenrods again with the, with the bumblebees on them. Lots of different goldenrods. I have the elm leaf goldenrod in the shade. Most of them want sun, but the elm leaf is just as beautiful and, and supports the bees. Uh, these are woodland sunflowers. Most of the sunflowers are full sun, but if you have a wooded area, these are lovely. And they, they, they are, they're somewhat aggressive, but they sprinkle themselves around in the, in the woods where nothing else is blooming there. And that really is a support for the, the, the pollinators that still need the pollen. And be sure you have some asters. And again, need to make sure that you get, there's lots of native asters. They are just an attraction for the butterflies and they bloom well into, right up until frost. So they may be the only thing blooming for the, for the, the last of the monarchs that are ready to, to do their, uh, their migration. In the winter, here's my pale purple cone flowers with the big seed heads on them. Oh shoot, sorry about that. Um, this isn't a very good picture of a, of a white pine, but they have the, they have the, the pine cones that the, the, the birds use all winter long, both on the tree and on the ground if they get them. And of course the acorns, um, and, and I, I say I have a nutty yard because I have oaks, hickory wall, and walnuts. Uh, my hazelnuts were, were too shaded to, to do much, but uh, those will last. And of course, they, not only do the squirrels bury them, but the birds will even eat them in the spring if they still find them. And this is the winter berry. And it's got these lovely red uh, berries on it and they'll last all winter until the birds get them all. Um, but but a, a nice showy a shrub against the snow. And real quickly, a little bit about water. It can be all sorts of forms. Uh, some of you may have ponds and streams. Almost all of the wetlands in, the, in this, our area are absolutely choked by Phragmites, which is this big uh, one. People say they look pretty, but they are this the most aggressive thing you can imagine, or the reed canary grass. <clears throat> Get rid of those and put in native 
plants. This is a friend's uh, yard on Honey Lake. The, the lake is green here in the summer, but she's, this is her lawn. And then she's got the, <clears throat> the buffer in here between that and the water and it's full of critters. She's got, and her neighbors have the buckthorn right up at the water and it's black and dense and nothing lives there. This is my neighbor's yard. We have a stream <clears throat> that runs along by the road. And in mine, I, I tapered my hillside and planted native plants on it. She didn't, she put rocks along it. And of course, when the heavy rains come, it undercuts the rocks and they all went into the stream. So <clears throat> work on, on uh, erosion. If you have, <clears throat> If you have the bad invasive stuff so along your stream, <clears throat> the, the Phragmites, the giant reed here, it, for, <clears throat> you sh it's really, really tough to get rid of. The roots go 10, 12 feet sideways, so you can't pull it. Um, you may, if you have a small patch, you might be able to, uh, to smother it, but, but they're, they're really tough. You might need to get a, a professional. The, the landscapers that work with native plants around here <clears throat> have the equipment to go out into the wetland and, and have the kind of herbicides that they can use to kill them that doesn't get into the water. But you do need to work at getting rid of it. Um, I, I drive by the wetland on, on Quentin Road, just south of Lake Cook Road. And, and years ago, as I drove by, I could see the blue flag iris and the marsh marigolds blo blooming along the edges. And now it's just completely choked out with, with this Phragmites and, and, giant, and uh, reed canary grass. Uh, Critters need shelter. They need food and they need clean water. And you, if you have some, it's nice to attract the water birds if you have a big enough uh, wetland. Although I've had, I've had ducks in the spring in my, in my tiny little stream. So they, they go looking for water. And as I mentioned, dragonflies must have water for the nymphs to hatch and they must have plants along. And by the way, they don't want a pond with a, with a plastic bottom. They need to have mud. So put your, put your pond in and put put plants in it, in the, in the soil rather than a, a liner. I won't take a lot of the time about rain gardens. We could do a whole hour on, on rain gardens, but they are another source of water. Uh, this is a, uh, Alicia Tim is our head of, of uh, the Habitat Quarters program. And this is her rain garden. And you can see the plants along here, there's the water after a heavy rain. And this is the blue flag iris and the, and the marsh marigold that are just lovely to have in a rain garden. And they provide, it's an opportunity to provide all the things that the birds need and the, and the pollinators as well. And, and uh, if you don't have a pond, or even if you do, you, you may want, you should have some source of water. They need water. So uh, here's, a, here's a, a bird bath in the summer. And this is Meredith Tucker's <coughs> heated bird bath. There's a little bit of an electric uh, cord. It has to be able to plug in. But here it is sitting in the snow, but the water is not ice. I mean, it, it, it keeps it warm enough for the birds in the winter. And, and she said she loves to just watch them coming to them all the time. I don't have a winter one yet. Real quickly, we've talked a little bit about ground covers. Here are some that you might want to pay attention to. I, I recommend for your habitat that you create compost. This is my, uh, I, I have a big compost pile behind my shed. And I put the, the leaf, uh, I would tend to chop up the oak leaves because they take a long time to disintegrate. Um, but the leaves in the fall, all the grass clippings in the summer, uh, I don't put weeds in it because it doesn't get hot enough to kill the weed seeds. But I do put uh, any of the plant clip clippings, you know, that, I, that I'm cutting down deadheading in there. And it makes this wonderful compost that I, I use mostly to top, uh, dress, you know, I'm not, I have terrible clay, but I, and I'm not digging very much anymore, but I, but I'll put it on the surface of it and it, it continues to help it. If you want mulch, leaf mulch is best. Um, it's native, the, the thing that beasties love to live in it. And, but there's also a, a reason to have all of the, not have bare soil and not have uh, imitation mulch. But it, uh, here are some of the ground covers. I think you probably know about the wild ginger. Sedges work. They're a little bit taller, but they can serve as a, as a nice ground cover. I love the ferns. These are my maiden hairs, but you, you know, any kind of a fern works. Virginia creeper is the woodbine. It has a bad rap because it climbs up trees and they, people think it kills the trees and it doesn't. But it's, it really does hold a lot of, uh, uh, serves a lot of, of uh, habitat needs. Uh, lots of moths. Get rid of the English ivy and put in Virginia creeper instead if you have that. 
And then this is the Virginia water leaf, uh, which is uh, gets a little bit taller, but I have it around the base of my oak trees. It, it, it's fine in the shade. It has this lovely bloom on it and the bees love it. And it's so much better than just a bare old mulch. This is some of the ones that are more happier in the sun. Uh, the sand prairie phlox is just gorgeous. It spreads and it makes a nice little mat. If you have a dry, uh, sort of a sandy area in the sun, that would be a huge, a great, great thing to add. Uh, and then there's the purple lovegrass, an interesting little grass. It doesn't get tall, uh, but it spreads. So you can have, instead of turf grass, you can put this one in. And uh, whatever, you don't buy cedar mulch. I think it's just absolutely criminal to cut down wonderful cedar trees to make mulch out of their bark. That just doesn't make sense to me. Although they cut them down to make the lawn furniture and then use the, the bark for mulch. And don't buy dyed mulch. That's not adding anything to the, to the habitat. The best mulch is leaves. But if you're purchasing it, look for coconut coir. It's ground up coconut husks. So you're not damaging trees to get it. And it really does add uh, good uh, uh, nutrients to the soil. And finally, a little bit about critters. The uh, Amphibians, if you have water, you'll have some of those, um, maybe some turtles. Uh, we all have raccoons around um, in the possums. Most of them, the, the, the possums are vegetarian, so they will eat some things. Um, the deer and rabbits, uh, with those, I, this is in my front woods, a deer looking at me and they're not afraid of anything. I just use a lot of deer off on the plants that I know they like to eat. <clears throat> um, particularly in the spring, they love the tender lung sh young shoots of things. <clears throat> I have the, uh, the native hydrangeas and they just will eat them right down to the back base if I don't get the, the, the deer off on them. That's my best, and I, you know, I, I tried a deer fence, but I didn't do the right kind and they just jump right through the, the wires of it. Uh, by the way, spiders aren't that bad. And again, you may not want them inside your house, but birds do eat those. And we haven't seen many fly or fireflies around, but that's because their habitat is gone. They must have leaf litter to live in in the winter. And if they only have turf grass and, and bare soil or mulch, they, you won't have them. And yes, we have some bad bugs. But uh, even these, uh, the, the, the birds are happy eating the Japanese beetle. If you have a landscape company and they say, oh, you've got to put herbis a pesticide on your lawn because you've got grubs, don't let them do it because the robins and the, and the ground birds like morning doves will eat them. Not much we can do about the gypsy moths. As I mentioned earlier, we can do the viburnum borers if you can get to them early enough. I'm running over time. Real quickly, I've been talking about some of the earth friendly practices. This is my bat, one of my backyard pictures. Get rid of the, some of the turf grass. Don't get rid of all of it, but see all of these trees could have rings around them. Instead of shade, they could have a nice base under them. This is a, a, a good way to plant under trees. This is the, the phlox and this is the Virginia water leaf. And this is a, a, a golden Alexander over here. Lots of choices, shade plants or sun. Uh, and as we said earlier, don't put the mounds around them. Leave your leaves on the ground in the fall, not necessarily on your lawn, not on your lawn, but certainly in your beds. Leave snags and brush. Leave the stems as we talked about. For, by the way, the elderberry has sort of hollow stems and that's a great bush for, for the critters to live in in the, in the winter. Leave the seed heads for the finches. It's good. This is my yard, well, I was right before the snow, a, a messy yard, but, but uh, it's got a purpose. So don't use pesticides, use herbicide very sparingly. And by the way, native plants do not need or want fertilizer. Fertilizer just sometimes makes them get leggy or something. It's not really a, it, just save your money and don't do that. One last point about light pollution. It is the main cause for the loss of insect species, especially moths. It helps the predators get at them. Uh, it, it, it disorients birds. I don't know if you know about there's there's uh, conservation folks that go around the streets of Chicago early in the morning during migration seasons around the big big, big buildings because the birds bump into the buildings because of the light and then either die or in some cases land and the and the uh, conservation folks are trying to save them. Motion lights work if you want security or use LED yellow LED yellow LEDs. Apparently the yellow light doesn't cause the problems. This is what not to do.
So I hope you enjoy your habitat year round. This is in my backyard looking at my deck. You can make a difference. You can obviously add habitat. If you can't do it all at one time, make a point of adding some. Come to our spring sale in May. Uh, we have our, our pre-sales that starts in April and or in March, I think the end of March. Look on the CFC website and you can find that. And by the way, here are the um, photographers that have contributed to the photos on my program. And my friend Wayne Schild, who is unfortunately in the hospital right now with COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but he, all November, October, November, he was the one that made these things move and made, created all the pretty backgrounds for my slides. So I really thank him. And here are some resources. Um, we have the Native Plant Database on our website, as I said, citizensforconservation.org. We have the Native Plant Sale. It's always the first weekend in March, in May. Uh, and our Habitat Corridors program that uh, provides the, the site visits in the Barrington area. We don't go to the whole Chicago area, but there are other organizations that do. I referred to Doug Tallamy's book. Um, I put native, uh, midwestgroundcovers.com on here because they have, uh, they grow the native, the natural garden natives, which are local ecotype native plants. They don't sell them retail, unfortunately, but they do sell them to some of the local uh, garden centers. So if you go on the ground covers, Midwest Ground Covers website, look under natural garden natives and you can see a list of the places that sell their plants so that you can, they don't want to compete with the, with the wholesalers that they sell to, so they don't sell them retail, but, but you can find those at other times when the, when the spring native plant sales aren't happening. And here's another good uh, resource. The uh, National Wildlife Federation tells you which plants support which insects locally, so you can get that information too. And then, um, some video resources. The Chicago Living Quarters has been doing webinars since June. And uh, there was a program, I think this was in, I don't know, August maybe. Uh, these programs, more specifics than I was able to give you about each of these in, in, uh, in my overview. Uh, but they are on the chicagolivingcorridors.org, look under resources and video, and each of their programs has been videoed and has been recorded and put under there. And they're all wonderful presenters with lots of details. And then this is the program we're doing right now, which will also be recorded, it is being recorded and will be available. And I want to tell you about our um, February program. This is uh, Stephen Barton that I've been talking about is this amazing photographer, uh, but uh, also about all of the things he's done in his own yard to create the habitat and then to be able to photograph all the critters. So be sure you plan for that. It's uh, a Saturday morning again in February. So with that, uh, I think we are open for photos. I mean, for questions. <laughs> We're open to photos too, but yeah. <laughs> um, we did have a number of questions that came through for us. Could I ask you to stop your screen share? Okay. And end it so people can see your lovely face. Well, I have um, to get rid of that. There yeah. we are. <laughs> Excellent. So um, I tried to group questions as they came in by the, in the same order as which you went through the information. So we're gonna jump back and ask a few questions about trees to start with. Um, okay. First, about trees. Okay. Okay. So um, the first are just a couple of comments that came in. One is someone who wanted everyone to know that shag bark hickory is great for bats. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> and the tulip tree may also be called a yellow pop poplar. So, so you've got that information. Yeah, um, sure. We had somebody who asked a question about tulip tree that she had been, it had been suggested that she avoid um, planting that because it only supports one species. Do you know anything about that or? Uh, you know, the problem is there's more than one thing called a tulip tree. Ah. And I don't have uh, the native, the, the Latin name of the native one here I think right it's, now. Yes. Um, hmm. But you know, if if uh, I don't I, I don't know if my you can you can contact me at, at citizensforconservation.org when on there and there's a contact. Mm -hmm. uh, if if you send me your name, I'll look I'll look that up for you and get the get the Latin name of the of the the native tulip tree. Okay, I will say also um, the library has a number of Doug Tallamy's books. 
We don't specifically have um, bringing nature home, but I buy for that area. So I will look and see if it's still available. My guess is we probably owned it at one point and it, you know, fell apart, got old or whatever. It yeah, it, it, it's probably oh, more than 10 years ago that it was published. Okay. It's, right. still, it's still kind of a Bible, but he has new books, which I, yes. I you know, would, could recommend yes. as well. I actually know we've got one on order that's coming out, um, isn't available yet, but the nature of oaks, the rich ecology of our most essential native trees is yeah. coming soon. And it's in the library catalog now, if any of you are interested in that one. Um, so next, sorry, I just, as one does, made all my things disappear behind something else. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have someone who asks a question um, about planting under oaks without disturbing sensitive roots. That's a very good question. Uh, the white oaks particularly have their roots very close to the surface. Don't use a rototiller for sure, uh, but you can, you can you know, plant shallow rooted things. And some of the things I was talking about like the, um, the Virginia water leaf and the uh, ginger and whatnot, have, have pretty shallow roots. So you can dig a little hole and put them in, but, but don't, don't and, and if you need to put top dress it with some, some uh, a compost, don't try to dig up the whole area. I had, when I moved in, they had grass under all my white oaks in the backyard. <clears throat> and, and I was trying to keep, and the things like the um, Dutchman's britches and whatnot were coming up and I was trying to keep the lawnmower from, <laughs> no, don't cut those down until I was able to get rid of it. And I had to smother the grass. I didn't, I didn't want to try to, to you know, to, to dig the whole thing. So we smothered the grass and then we're able to put, and I didn't even need to do much planting because the, the native things wanted to come up. They were, they were trying to, and the grass was keeping them from doing so. Right. Um, and as so often happens with people who, who love gardening and love talking about it, um, we had, and I just sent a message out to everyone with the Latin name of the tulip tree. With oh, wonderful. A, couple, a couple of people provide it in the chat. So, so we're okay. just there. Um, we have a question about um, the fallen leaves and leaving them whole as opposed to shredding. That um, they had heard that leaving them whole enhances the habitat, habitat for caterpillar that harbor in the whole leaf. Um, that, that is true. Uh, and you really should have <clears throat> some areas that you can just blow the leaves over off your lawn and leave them in the, in the you know, the, the, the garden areas. <clears throat> I do that, but I also, I, I need to shred the ones to put in my compost because otherwise they don't disintegrate fast enough. So we do both, mm -hmm. but I, you know, I have a shredder, but I also, when, <clears throat> when we run the, the lawn run, more runs over the lawn, it, it shreds the leaves as well as the lawn and that all goes into the compost pile, but then, I, I have a yard service and I have them blow the leaves into the, into the woods or leave them. You know, I have a wooded area that just the leaves are just naturally there. But you, need, you do need to have some whole leaves for the, for the caterpillars, you're right. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, thoughts on black walnuts? <laughs> um, people think that they, well, they, they do have, uh, there's an aleopathy, which is the black walnuts killing some things that are under them. And I, I tried for a while to get a white pine to grow and, and I went to the nursery, this was years ago, and they kept saying, well, it's, it doesn't have pine blight. We don't know what's wrong with it. And then I was taking courses in the, in the horticulture program at, at Morton Arboretum and learned about aleopathy. And that is some, tree, some things kill other things and black walnuts kill white pine. So I couldn't have a white pine under it. But now I have elderberry under the, under the black walnut and um, they, it's fine, they love it. Um, I have, uh, uh, you know, I, earlier I showed you the, um, the red baneberry. I also have white baneberry under my walnuts and that does fine. Um, the the uh, ginger does fine. There's a, there's a lot of things that will be fine with it. Um, I, I, I suppose there's more that aren't. I'm trying to think of what, other than the white pine, I don't know that I've tried to plant anything else under the, white, under the uh, walnuts. Okay. Well, you kind of segued into a question that actually just came in that relates to that was someone asking for um, ground plants or ground cover that can survive under black walnuts. So of the things you mentioned, the ginger is a ground cover. That's right. right? The, um, the uh, Virginia water leaf works fine. Um, I didn't say anything about violets, but they're, they're a fine vi a ground cover. They are a native. Yes, they get in your lawn, but that, <laughs> I don't, I don't, <clears throat> I don't need to have a pristine lawn, but <clears throat> uh, they'll they'll grow just about anywhere. Um, 
Oh, the the it's Joe Pie, the the spotted Joe Pie is is uh, doing, going fine under my under my black walnut. So this that that's not a ground cover, but I mean it's it's uh, something that'll work. It, it okay. wants to be there. Yeah. Can I, can I chime in here? Um, uh, uh, Karen Rosine. Um, oh, hi, Karen. Hi. <laughs> um, I have I have read in several places that red bud it does fine. You can plant red bud underneath the black walnut. Okay, I am okay. gonna. Um, if you could put com put your comments in chat, and I'll read them out. It's just easier for recording. Thank you. Um, and same person who asked about ground cover asked specifically about red bud. So thank you for for anticipating that. Um, and service berry. And then we have someone who said um, Morton Arboretum website has a long list of plants that will survive under black walnut. Wonderful. So, yeah. And they mentioned, um, someone else mentions ginger, ferns, Jacob's Ladder, and wild violet that um, grows under the walnuts. So, um, okay. The other ones I have under a walnut that are the spring ephemerals, the, the uvularia, the bellwort, okay. uh, is, and it's, it's one of those, you know, bell-shaped flowers that the, that the, po the uh, pollinators like. Um, and uh, I have uh, shooting stars or under walnut. Um, trying to think of what else is in that bed. Wild geranium. You know, there's, there's a lot of things to do. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can also ask me which ones <laughs> the deer don't eat. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so the next section of questions that I have are about shrubs. And unsurprisingly, the first three are about buckthorn. Uh -huh. So um, I think some of these are kind of kind of related. So first, we have one listener who said, while they're walking in their yard, they can pull up small buckthorn trucks, roots and all. Is this actually getting rid of them or are they going to re-sprout? No, that's the best way to do it, if you okay. can. You can pull up by the root. Yeah, you don't have to use an herbicide. You can, and in the spring, usually when the ground is soft, the same thing is true with garlic mustard. You know, I don't, we didn't talk about that as an invasive, but, but pull it up by the, by the roots. By the way, one of the programs on the Chicago Living Corridors website is I did a program on invasives, just on invasive plants and, and uh, how to get rid of them. So that's recorded on the CLC website. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, also regarding buckthorn, um, what herbicides, are there specific herbicides that you recommend using on buckthorns? And I don't know if this is a related question or not, so I grouped them together. What to put on buckthorn stumps when you cut them down in the winter? Yeah, that, uh, I, you can get a, 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 a roundup that is um, for woody plants. That it, it, that's about what you can buy. In, in, in restoration, they're able to buy other, other kinds of herbicides, but they're not generally just on the market for, for, for common use. I really, really hate to, to, to promote uh, Roundup, round up, but <laughs> only use it on, on, uh, on Buckthorn, you're okay. On Buckthorn, not on windy days. You, don't do it. You, you just, you, you put a little, you don't spray it. You put a little bit in a, in a, in a bottle cap or something and use, use a paintbrush, a little paintbrush and just paint the stump. So you know you're only getting it right on, on, the, on the, the buckthorn. Could but I it, interject something here? I, I know you said to chat, I, I'm not getting my question to send, but I had a huge buckthorn thing growing and I chopped down all the branches and I burned them on top of the stump of the trunk and that was well over a year ago, and I have not seen one new sprout of that thing. And I have tried everything on buckthorn in the past. Now, it was an open area of wetlands, so I didn't have to worry about the fire, you know, spreading into anything. But I also, I chopped down a bunch of invasives around it, too, to make sure it didn't spread. And that really worked. So maybe like the fear and intimidation tactic, right? This is what you have coming if you keep trying to grow in my yard. That's right. Fire works. Well, you know, and Citizens for Conservation and our restoration, we burn the prairies. And, and if there are little, yeah. little shoots of buckthorn coming up, that's one of the reasons you burn. You know, they wouldn't, you wouldn't get a, a big old, you know, huge old tree, but it'll, but it'll get the little shoots that way. But that's good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, then moving on from buckthorn. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That's not moving on from buckthorn yet. 
So after you have gone through and painted your stumps or you know, used that herbicide in small areas, do you need to wait before you plant viburnum or other replacement? Native That's herbicide? a good question and I didn't address that. Yes, uh, <clears throat> because the soil is poisoned and, and you need to have it you know, a, a, a season maybe or so. I think the shrubs are better, but if you were to put little you know, tender uh, woodland plants, they, they probably wouldn't do very well. Um, the, the, you, you can dig some of that soil out from around the, the buckthorn and, and, and replace the soil, but yeah, you, you don't want to immediately put something in. But, and that's a chore because you, know, you don't want the buckthorn seeds. Oh, by the way, even after you cut the buckthorn down, the seeds are still in the ground for a couple of years. So you'll continue to get more little shoots coming up. You just have to be real uh, persistent with it. Okay, All right. Um, By the way, I just a little anecdote about buckthorn that I didn't say. It's 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 genus is cathartica, and that's because it it uh, birds eat the seeds, but they don't digest them. They go right through them and they plant them everywhere. So as in, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, what is the? Oh, I don't know, the there's, a, there's a medical word for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Arsis um, was trying to think of. What native shrubs do not sucker and spread in the listener specifically besides because they have chokeberry that's coming up everywhere? Uh -huh. um, oh, there's a lot of them that don't. Uh, I didn't even mention the, um, the spice bush uh, because it, you have to have a male and a female of that. And if you get, the, the, you get both, you get berries otherwise. And it's a pretty sparse tree. So it's not a good, it's not a, a dense enough tree really for habitat. Um, but, um, oh, let's see, which ones do I talk about? The, the, the service berries, just they, they make a big clump but they don't sucker all over the place. I don't think, at least mine haven't. Um, and, the, and the maple leaf viburnum are, are quite uh, conservative. And that's a, 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 a nice, you know, smallish one. They, it doesn't get massive. I don't know what size you need, or you also have to pay attention to the, you know, what's wet or, wet or dry or messic kind of soil. By the way, the very last uh, program from the Chicago Living Quarters uh, that was Thursday night was on native shrubs. And that is going to be posted on the CLC website. So chicagolivingquarters.org. So and the can... libraries as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. right. Yes, yeah. great. Yeah. Um... I am gonna, we're still getting, I have several questions, a, a handful of questions still to go through and we're getting more coming up in chat. So I think what we'll say for the ones that are coming up in chat now, I will um, copy them and send them to Peggy and um, we'll include those answers okay. um, in written form, but we still have a dozen or so to get through. And I ran over and now and we're running over time. Yeah. I mean, we're only two minutes over. I think we're fine, but, but we could spend a lot of time on these things. So <laughs> I don't want anybody who's who's putting questions in chat now to be like, hey. So to you, yeah. Um, if we want a tall shrub as a filler, is it okay to use staghorn sumac? Is it a native, basically? Yes, it is. And yes, it is okay. Uh, it it is, it doesn't, you know, it, it spreads out. It doesn't get real dense, but but yeah, absolutely. And okay. it does have the nice uh, seed heads on it in, in the in the fall, so that, that is a source of food. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you mentioned butterfly weed, and I think that was specifically the tuberosa. Yes. Um, is that one that could tolerate being in a roadside planting where it might get some, you know, splashed from salt and things like that in the winter time? Um, I, I would say probably don't, but I don't know that for sure. Uh, it, it's, it, it's pretty tough, but it's not, I mean, it, it, it wants to be tampered a little bit. So maybe, okay. maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. Okay. Now I have my, I have my um, New Jersey tea right by the road, right by my, my, my little, little prairie by the road and it, it does fine. Okay. I don't know. Right. It's not a milkweed, but it's one that is okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, backyard habitats, we had someone ask, how do you transplant wildflower wildflowers yourself without harming them. The listeners never seem to survive transport. 
Well, they, they, they differ. Uh, some of them are, are much more uh, uh, transplantable. The wild ginger, you can, the, the roots go sideways and you can cut them off and, and take a, a clump up and it does just fine. Uh, I've transplanted my uh, uh, woodland phlox, as I mentioned, all lots because it, it pops up in lots of different places and sometimes I just like it more in a clump. Um, all, most of them are, most of them, I think, the, 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 well, the bigger they are, the harder it is. You know, the, the, you know, the prairie plants have roots that go really, really far down. I've never tried to transplant uh, uh, purple coneflower, for and uh, not coneflower, uh, Joe pie wheat, for example. It has really deep roots, and I'm not sure, how do you, you know, that, that how that would work. But but some of the little ones, if you you know, just you just take a clump with the soil and and put it right back in the ground someplace. I. I've transplanted my, my Jacob's ladder a lot. I've transplanted ferns. Um, I transplant a lot, actually. Okay. You know, when I open a new bed, I, instead of buying new things, I just have lots of stuff I can move around. And so I do. That's <laughs> right okay. The one thing that I found that does not transplant are uh, the hickories. Okay. I get little little hickory things coming up all over the place. And sometimes they're not in a place where they can, they can live, you know, like a, a foot away from a site driveway or something and my neighbor was wanting to add more trees and I tried I and we dug way down and they got a root that goes down but it was more work and then it didn't survive so okay. you know I think you're better off buying one that's already potted and you know grown in a pot so its roots are in a clump okay all right um next is oh we just had someone who um and it appears that they are familiar with the photograph on the the fringed is it gentian? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that that is not the one with the Katie did on it is not in fact fringe gentian, but is prairie gentian. And it says it was taken on the knoll at Flint Creek Savannah. So just thank you. Yes. I, when you say that, that's exactly right. I'm going to have to, did I have it labeled fringe or did I just say fringe? I I'll have to go back and look, but yeah. thank you for catching that. You're absolutely right. It's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty rare. <laughs> you okay. know. Yeah. Um, well, it's a French tension for that matter, but yeah. yeah. Um, looking at water plants, water gardens, um, what water plants are safe in a pond that dogs are going to drink from? Uh, oh boy. Uh, a lot of, you mean the, 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 because of their being trampled? Uh, <laughs> I think it's that. I know like with house plants, there's a list of plants you shouldn't have in your house if you have pets. Oh, for the dog. For the dog. Oh, I thought it was for the plants. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Um, I frankly don't know. Okay. Um, I, I, I would tend to think that things like the blue flag iris and, and the marsh marigolds, uh, lots of the sedges, I, I can't, I don't know that any of them put any poison out you know, but I've not ever wanted to drink the water. So, I, right. <laughs> but, and you know, you don't, they aren't, I mean, you're not what plants that you'd eat either. Um, so who, I, don't, I guess, would an ex, if CFC didn't have that information on their site, would you go to an extension? Would you try the botanic gardens? Yeah, uh, the, the botanic gardens has researchers. So they are more likely to have known, you know, looking at something like that. Um, that, that's an interesting question. I'll have to see if I can't find some information about that. But uh, I don't have a dog, and so I'm not, <laughs> it's not something I personally paid attention to, and I've never heard anybody ask that before. But I would, I would tend to think you'd have to be looking at which plants have, uh, uh, I don't know, juices, whatever it is that would, would go into the water from the plant that would be dangerous for a dog. Yeah, yeah, I know, for example, the dog I had before, the current dog, I had um, used a little bit of cocoa shell, not coconut, but the cocoa shell that smells like chocolate. And the dog before was an extraordinarily well-behaved dog. She would never have eaten it in a million years, where this dog will try anything once, so I can't have cocoa shell mulch anymore. So things like that. And is that the same problem that, that you have with dogs eating chocolate? Uh, yes, for the same reason, the yeah. romine, I think it's called. Actually, I'm so glad you said that. There is, I know that there is a book that we have at the library that is specifically about landscaping when you have a dog. Oh, what? 
wonderful. I can't think of the exact title, but I know that that which it. ones the dogs don't don't da- uh, damage as well. Right. But. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> both ways. What what will survive a dog running over it, and what will not harm the dog. So, Interesting. Good I, good resource. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I would um, try. I will try to put that in the notes for the video. Okay. So I'll find the thing. Um, if someone who actually this is me, I'll I'll be honest. I had a problem with ants last year, and we tried, you know, the boric acid, all the things, and they just kept coming back and kept coming back. And I finally figured out they were getting in where my sliding glass door is. There's just that minuscule little hole. And I'd read on a, um, on a, you know, went to a site about what's safe to use and they suggested cinnamon. So I took a Costco sized shaker of cinnamon and put it all along the edge of my sliding door, cleaned all my counters with vinegar and no more ants. Interesting. Work. I've had success with boric acid. Yes, yes. That will, once they're in, that will get rid of I, them. But I, I them have them. an ant nest under my under my deck and they, they've come into the kitchen from there. And, and uh, I just, on the outside, I just along the edge of the, the deck in the house, I put the boric acid and that made yeah. a difference. Yeah. Excellent. Um, we have someone who asked if CFC offers tours of members gardens is that a thing that you have done we have uh we haven't we haven't scheduled any uh recently uh we could certainly do so again uh once we can all be back out doing things yeah we'll probably probably wouldn't be this spring but we could we could do that again (laughs) i've done i've done tours of my yard um in in may is the best time because i have all the woodland wildflowers but uh not this year okay um, we have to, do you have someone who asks for a virtual tour? So that's something we'll put, we'll put in the, in the hopper as an idea. Maybe we can, the library and CFC can do something like that for April, put together a virtual tour. Oh, that might be fun. Yeah. Uh-huh. April or May. Um, I, I ha- have not been able to do that because I, I have, I, I, I don't have the camera skills to be able to do, do that and be talking yeah. at the same time. So right. <laughs> take yeah. lots of still fit photos, but not videos while I'm walking around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We can find your partner or someone. Yeah. Stand. Yeah. yeah. Um, someone um, mentioned in chat that uh, the ASPCA has a list of plants that are poisonous to pets. So that's oh, a good resource cool. as well. Look at that. Okay. Um, and does CFC have a list of landscapers that specialize in native friendly techniques in the area? Um, we, we actually, the, the best source for that is on uh, the Chicago Living Corridors website. Okay. Uh, they're under resources. Um, I think it's under resources. Anyway, dig around and find it. Um, we we will, will make recommendations based on the circumstances, but we don't just publish a list of them from CFC. Okay, but CLC, I could, I could talk to living them, corridors, talk to them. Yeah. would be a resource for that. Excellent. Um, I think those, I know that there are other questions that came up in chat um, or just suggestions, recommendations. I don't know that we have time to get to everything that is in there. Yeah. Um, but I will share these with you and, and we'll try to come up and answer them, answer them in another format. Okay. Um, two or three other things to mention, as we said, um, it, it will not be instant. It will probably take a few days, but both um, Citizens for Conservation and the Barrington Area Library will post the reporting so you can refer back to things. I know there are things that I missed because I was retyping questions that came up in the chat. Um, so that'll be there as a resource for you. Um, towards the end of her talk, Peggy mentioned um, the over, you know, landscape lights, that sort of thing, or front porch lights. I did a program um, with someone who works on the dark sky, I can't remember the full name of it. There is a dark sky organization and this gentleman works at the um, Adler Planetarium. So I did a presentation um, in collaboration with Go Green Barrington. And that is available on the library's website. If you go to our homepage, scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a link to the YouTube, and then it's under community catalysts for why a dark sky. And there's there's a lot of information there. It's much more um, pervasive of a problem than I would have expected. 
to the, um, the, the fact that our skies are never completely dark, that our world is never completely dark, yeah. um, affects cancer treatments. Oh, for I that. never ever would have made that association. It, yeah, it's 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 bigger than I than I put on my slides. One of the things it does is affects migrations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, he's got a great um, graphic that shows kind of how that works. So, um, and then it, part of the reason that the library is working so hard to do these partnerships with local environmental groups is that we are very fortunate. Um, some of you probably know we started a seed library last year, shortly before everybody had to go home and stay there. Um, but the library does have, a, the Barrington Area Library has a seed library. I know many CFC members helped with collecting native seeds and donating them to us for repackaging this past year. Mm -hmm. So we'll hope to be offering that again within a few months. Um, and also we are going to have a teaching garden in the coming months. Um, they've dug out space in an area behind the library and we're working with several local groups, including CFC and some others. Um, I think the local Rotary is donating some benches, so it'll be a pleasant place nice. to sit. So yeah, we're really excited about that group project. So, I might just add, it's sort of along that note, mm -hmm. um, we are uh, renovating the demo garden around the Citizens for Conservation headquarters on, on uh, Highway 22. And uh, we got some things in last summer and we're getting put some more in and people can just come over and, and walk around, you know, and look at it. It's, we, we, do, we do do organized tours at Citizens for Conservation, uh, particularly of Flint Creek Savannah, uh, because that's a mature prairie and, and Savannah. And, uh, you know, for, it, it's, not, it's not your backyard or your front yard garden, but, it, but if people are just interested in seeing these plants in their native habitat, it, you can ask for a tour and we'll do that. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Um, again, I have a bunch of people who are saying thank you, thank you, thank you in the chats. So I will, um, I will pass those along. Um, okay. People really enjoyed this, learned a lot from it. And again, we will have the recording up if you register. Obviously, if you're here, you registered for the program. So I will send an email out to everyone who is registered. Um, with a link to it, and it will also be available for future reference through the library's YouTube channel or on CFC's website under their education tab. So, all right. Thank Thanks, you very Paul. much. Hope we see you at our February program. Look for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye.